We are, are continuing in our series on the greatest sermon of all time, and that is the Sermon on the Mount. You find it in Matthew chapter 5. And, and you know, as a pastor, I have come to the conclusion that many people just don't understand who God is and, and what he is about or why he has given us his word. His word brings life. It is refreshing. And, and, and God has such compassion. You know, people view God as, as mean, as anti-fun, as anti-life, insecure. Or, you know, you hear people say that that big grandfather in the sky and he he's just has an old, he's old, has a long white beard and, and he is out of touch when you move into 2024. And it's just, it's just not true. You know, God is not old. He is eternal. He is eternal. He is not out of touch. He is omniscient. And this world is not out of control because he is in control. So when we start seeing things around the world, things that are happening in our own backyard, listen, God is not oblivious. He is not out of control. He is right where he should be. And so we, we have to remember that. He is not mad. He is not angry at people. He loves. He cherishes you. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless me. That's why in Matthew chapter 5, We've, we have seen he starts this masterful sermon in saying, blessed are. And we walk through each one of those. And that word means happy many times over. It means fulfillment. And this is what God wants to give us. He, he wants to protect us. And so as we come to Matthew chapter 5, we are coming into this section where, where Jesus begins to say, you have heard it was said this way. You have heard it was taught this way. But I want to tell you this. And he layers this truth again. He says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4, because this is what he's talking about in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27, that you shall not commit adultery. He goes and he's sharing with the people, you've heard that it was said, you should not commit adultery. So as Tawan said, this is kind of a, a, a hard uh, topic, but I want to walk this through and, and hopefully we gain understanding Again, seeing God's heart that he doesn't want us to hurt. He doesn't want us to have pain. He wants us to be fulfilled. Now, I would like to just preface this message with a couple thoughts. The first is this. God understands the human body. He created us. He created our sex drive. He is the inventor of sex. Not the devil. Not the enemy. It's not nasty or gross. It's, it's not perverted. He invented this. And, and, and God intended that there would be fulfillment in sex. We, we must remember that he is the designer of our bodies. He is the designer of our emotions. God is not trying to limit someone's pleasure. He... he, he understands because he has created us. Secondly, he gave us rules regarding its use because it was his intent that this wonderful gift would not be used to hurt people and bring destruction and bring devastation and perversion to their life. We have to understand that or else as we read Matthew chapter 5, we're not really going to understand God's heart. And he wants us to understand it. And some people may say, well, if he is, if he is the creator and he knows our bodies and he's telling us that, that and we get into this subject matter, um, 
what he is asking us to do to refrain from sexual intimacy if we're not married. How can you have this standard? It's too high of a standard. I mean, after all, I'm only human. And God says, I know. That's why I need you to come to me. That's why I need you to open your heart to me. Because I want to show you not only truth, but I want you to see how you can be fulfilled in me. And when he begins to go through the beatitude, he Beatitudes, he talks about this. Again, this is a layered message. This is not Jesus preaching 20 messages like we have. He, he, is, he sits the people down and he begins to share his heart, share truth. He begins to open up the word of God like they've never heard it before. If you remember, he, he, he criticizes the pastors of the day because they tried to keep the law and they knew they couldn't. So what they did, they added their own human understanding and human laws to <clears throat> the law and it was impossible for anyone to keep. Jesus lets them know that, listen, if, if you hold to what the Pharisees are teaching and the Sadducees are teaching, listen, you've missed it. You've missed it. So in order for us to get a better grasp of this, Jesus now elaborates on what he has said, what God has said in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14, where he says, um, you shall not commit adultery. So let's go to the text in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27. Now Jesus understands that they have heard this. So he says, listen, you have heard that it was said from the law, from the Ten Commandments, from Moses, that, that you shall not commit adultery. So let's take a look at the deed itself. Jesus is reminding the audience that it was wrong for a person to engage in sex with someone else when one or both of them are married. But he goes beyond that and includes all sex outside of marriage. Listen, that is nothing new to scripture and it is not unique to Matthew chapter 5. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, Paul says, or do you not know any speaking to the church? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So do not be deceived. The unrighteous are people that, that are living their own lives. They, have, they may understand or hear the word, but they're not abiding by the word. They are continuing in a, a, a sinful action over and over and over again, saying, listen, it doesn't matter because God loves me. So, so Paul comes and, he, and he's elaborating again on what Jesus has said in his sermon. He says, listen, the unrighteous are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And we're going to see in a minute because it's a heart thing. So he says, do not be deceived. Neither the sexual, uh, sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. He says to the church in Galatia, Galatia chapter 5 and verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. So if we are living from our flesh, Paul says, isn't it obvious? Why? Because, because this is not the direction that the Spirit of God is taking us. And if the Spirit of God is living in us, there should be a, a uh, um, draw to what God loves and what hurts his heart. So he says, listen, it's, it's, it's evident the works of the flesh are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. In, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, for this is the will of God. What is the will of God? That's one of the major, this, that is one of the, 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 the most sought after things that people ask me when, for counseling. Dale, I just need to, what is the will of God? And they express to me what they're walking through. What they're, I just want the will of God. 
You know, when you study the Bible all over from Genesis to Revelation, you will begin to see what the will of God is. Now, it's not always easy to follow it, but, but it's, it's there. This is one example, 1 Thessalonians 4.3, and he flat out says it. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Mark chapter 7, 21, from within, and here's the crux of it. From within, out of the heart of a person. So out of the flesh comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, <clears throat> murder, and adultery. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 the, in the Old Testament, the writer says, above all else, guard your heart. Why? Because it brings life. It brings fulfillment. It brings joy. Right? Because it's the wellspring, the writer says. It's the wellspring of life. And so Jesus, as he's preaching this masterful message from the beginning until the end, he lets people know, listen, I love you. I care for you. I don't want you to be hurt. I don't want you to have heart damage. I don't want you to go through pain. I don't want you to have to go through four, five, six years to get over guilt. Even though you've asked for forgiveness, but yet the flesh, the mind continues to feel guilty. Even though God doesn't have anything to do with that. He's already forgiven you. He has already set you free. But, but there's things in our, our heart that the enemy tries to latch on to. And God says, I don't want you to ever have to go through that. I don't want you to have to go through a damaged heart or depression or anxiety or doubt me or fear or unhealthy behaviors or anger or bitterness or gossip or self-righteousness. Blessed are Jesus in the same sermon, which we've already uh, talked about in the beginning of the year. He gives us a prayer. The Lord's Prayer, it's called. Theologians call it. And you remember, we, we, we have said, it is not a model prayer. It's not something just to be recited. And, and it, it is a model of prayer, right? And so, and so we walk through that. So all through this sermon, I, I need you to see this, especially in these next several weeks, because there's some hard topics that Jesus discusses. That he loves us. He wants the best for us. He, he, he truly uh, cares for us. And so we have to have that understanding as we, as we walk through this. Now, you may say, Dale, why is it so wrong? Because it's not a big deal. And again, we're, we actually are in 2024, just in case you didn't realize this. Why is it so wrong? to have sex outside of marriage. To answer that, we have to understand a few things. Sexual intimacy first is more than just an act. It's more than just a biological drive or an urge that we can't control. As I counsel people in this area, you know, I, I've had people say, you know, pastor, but I, you know, I, I, it's so strong. I, I have urges. As, as though to say, hey, you're a preacher. You have nothing. You don't know about this. But I want you to tell you, I mean, I have, I have needs. And we accuse God as if he is denying us something like food or water. Or something that is critical to survival. Remember, God wants us to know fulfillment. God wants us to know pleasure. God wants us to know joy and blessing. But when we misuse the gifts that he has given us, when we misuse this pulpit, when people misuse a pulpit, when we, you just read 1 Corinthians 13, and, and Jesus said what? 
people preach in my name, do miracles in my name, have faith in my name, do all these things in my name, but they misused it. They misused the gift. They did not, they did not have love. They did not follow first and foremost the two greatest commandments that Jesus says is the foundation of life is the foundation of Christianity. And that's loving God basically and loving people with all of your heart. And so, so they misuse these gifts, sex included. Sex included. When we misuse a gift that God has given us because he has created our bodies, life is diminished. It's lesser. Sexual intimacy goes way beyond just a, 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 uh, an act. Look at it in Genesis 2 and verse 22. In the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh and shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, because that is true, a man then shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And watch this. They shall become one flesh. Body, soul, they're, they're, they're united. In that moment of sexual intimacy, what happens is two people are made into one person. In other words, there is a union. There is a union that takes place. The Apostle Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 6 and 13. And he says this. <clears throat> food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. But it's meant for relationship with the Lord. And the Lord for relationship with the body. So when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, again, the Spirit of God dwells within us. The Bible says we are a temple. We are a, we are a, a temple of the, whole, of, of the Spirit. And so, so this, is, this, is, this is going deeper into our spiritual understanding what Jesus is trying to tell not only those 2,000 plus years ago, but also us in 2024. Paul goes on to say, and God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are, are, are now members of Christ? You remember he's talking to the church. Shall I then take the members and, and make them members of, of, a, of a prostitute? And he says, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> you say, Dale, this idea of becoming one between two people who love and care for each other. And Paul says, no, it's not just between two people who just say they love each other and they care for each other. It's, it's deeper than that. As we read in Genesis and we're going to continue to see scriptures all throughout the word of God. But, but even here, Paul says, even it's, if it's with a prostitute, even if you have a sex with somebody, it's a one night stand or a prostitute or someone you don't care about or something you're just doing on a fling. A person who <clears throat> you develop no emotional attachment to. He says this in verse 16. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute, watch this, becomes one body with her? And he goes back to the Old Testament and he says, for it was written, the two shall become one flesh. <clears throat> so there is a union that takes place. A moral, it's a moral law of the universe. C.S. Lewis said this, and I quote, whenever a man lies with a woman there, whether they like it or not, a transcendental relation is set up between them, which must be eternally enjoyed or internally endured. When you have two people together, and again, 
outside of the bonds of marriage, outside of the bonds of a husband and wife, a man and a woman. And the two come together, right, sexually. Even though we already looked, and, and, and it's more than just that. There is, a, there is a union then that takes place that is a moral law of the universe. And it doesn't mean we can't be forgiven, which we're going to see. It doesn't mean that we can't be made whole. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want to heal. Again, remember, he doesn't want us to, to go through pain. He has created us. He knows us. And so when that union then breaks up, and you try to separate that union. You know, you, and, and the two go their separate ways. There, there, there's, you know, there's things attached. So, so that's exactly what happens in a sexual relationship. That's why God says, hey, I love you. And adultery does not work. Because it strikes at the very uh, personhood of a individual. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18, so he says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body. But the sexual immoral person sins against their own body. And we just read that in Corinthians of what he is talking about. You and I sin against our own person and there is damage that is done there. People back away from what God intended to bring joy, to bring fulfillment, to bring pleasure, to bring blessing. And God knows this because he has created us. And, and, and he, is, he is giving us understanding because of his love. Remember, what we see in the Old Testament or the law illustrates to us physically the spiritual realities of life in the New Testament. And I know I say that a lot, but I, I say it for a reason. That, that we will remember when we're going through life that there is such a thing called the Spirit. That there are things happening in the spirit. That we're not just living in the physical. Remember, we are not of this world. We are passing through. This is not our home. This is, we can't get too attached to, to, this, to this land. And to the things that this land provides. We have to remember that there is a spiritual world that, that we are going to spend eternity in. And that's where our treasures need to be first. And God is trying to say, I want you to be all that you can be. When you are in your business, when you are with your families, when you are with strangers and you're representing me, I want you to be fulfilled. I want you to be blessed. I want people to see you in me. And I don't want you to experience pain and hurt and frustration. You heard it was said. That you shouldn't commit adultery. But I tell you. And you could hear a pin drop probably. As Jesus was hitting this point. Spirituality, adultery, fornication. It kills us. It destroys us and brings death into our situation. Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 3. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. And her speech is smoother than oil. The point here is sexual allurement. It, 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 it seems exciting. It looks and feels so good. You're, you're at a point where you find yourself saying in a relationship, God is in this. He's so great. He's so amazing. Man, I've never had a woman understand me like that. Man, she is just, woo. And when I get her alone, it's just, I, I've, never, I've never experienced anything like that. I, I mean, God is just blessing me. And I've heard this over, I mean, over and over again. Watch what the Bible says, Proverbs 5.5. 5. Her feet, and I know it's her, it's, it's not a male or a female. 
It's talking about, I want you to understand that. This is talking about the temptation. This is talking about uh, fornication, adultery. It's talking about lust. Her feet go down to death. There's a trap. Our flesh desires this. Her steps fall to the path of Sheol, which is speaking of a, like a hell. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander and she does not know it. And now, O oh sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way from, far from her and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. You say, what is that? What is, well, you fool around. You, 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 uh, you, you fall to the temptation. Sadly, maybe your marriage falls apart. She marries someone else and you're paying child support. You're enriching another man's home. This is what the proverb is saying. And at the end of your life, you groan. When your flesh and body are consumed and you say, man, why didn't I listen? Why didn't I see God for who he was? He's not mean and angry and hateful. He's a loving God. He's a merciful God. He cares for me. He, he loves me. Man, I hated discipline. My heart despised reproof. I didn't want anyone telling me what to do. Especially that Italian preacher. I didn't want anybody telling me what it was or what it was. He doesn't even know the Bible. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to instruction. I'm at the brink of utter ruin in the assembly congregation. The Proverbs 6, 27, can, can a man carry fire next to his chest and, and his clothes be not burned? No. Can a woman do it? No. Can a teenager do it? No. Or can one walk on hot clothes, uh, coals and their feet not be scorched? No. So is the person who goes in to his neighbor's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. Listen, this is a moral law of the universe. If I could scare everyone in this room into not committing adultery or not to be in fornication, I would do it. Why? Because the consequences will, will, will wreak havoc on our life. Because it creates heart damage. This is, this is not God being evil. This is not God being mean. Come on. I mean, sex is no big deal. Everybody's doing it. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, I want to see if I'm compatible with the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. And, I, and, and, and sex is a big part of marriage. So I need, to, I need to play the field some. I need to know what I'm up against. God says, I love you. I know that's what your flesh thinks. I know that's how you're reasoning things out. But I'm telling you, it's a trap. It's deception. It's, it's going to hurt you. I'm not saying you're not going to be forgiven. I'm not saying I'm, 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 I'm going to leave you because if you come to me and cry out to me, I'll be there. I'll, I'll do everything I can to heal. But your mind is powerful. The flesh is strong. And I know this because I know God says what sin does. And I know that I'm stronger, but I need you to press into me. And I'm going to help you, but better for you not to go through it. Better for you not to be trapped. Better for you not to give in. Because I want to bless you. Because I love you. And I care for you. Do you see it? God says, I don't want you to suffer. Well, God knows this, so let's look at the desire. He says, but I, now Jesus has everybody just in their seats. 
just waiting to hear what he's got to say because he's already been correcting thoughts, right? We've, we've seen that the last three weeks. Now he says, but I say to you <laughs> that everyone who looks at a woman or looks at a man with lustful intent, everything that we just talked about, Jesus says has already committed adultery with them in their heart. Wow. I mean, maybe when everyone heard that, they're like, man, I can't do this. I'm out of here. I mean, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Now, I want to clarify something here. This is not the inadvertent glance, admiring beauty. I mean, I've sat down, I've, been, I've watched TV, and I, I, I've said to my wife as she's sitting there with me, man, that she, she's good looking. <clears throat> and, and it's fine. I mean, I still didn't have to sleep on the couch or anything like that. <laughs> I mean, she, she'll be here second service, but I mean, she thinks Johnny Depp is like gorgeous. And so, you know. So there's nothing wrong in admiring a person who's handsome a person who's, who, who you feel is, is beautiful. Martin Luther writes this, you can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. So, so that's what... So Jesus tells us that this is a heart issue. It, it's, it's, it's the second glance. It's the third glance. It's the fourth glance where we latch on in our heart where our flesh begins to override everything and we, and we latch it, we cultivate it, we, we fantasize about it. You, you, you do it for what it does inside of you. How it makes you and I feel. Jesus says, whenever you look at a man or a woman for the purpose of lusting, Notice, you have already committed adultery, he says, in your heart. So Christ has taken us beyond the physical act. Why? Because in the Old Testament, he even said, this is not just a physical act. You remember we, just, we shared the scriptures? It's not just a physical act. So you have heard that it was said this, but I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to get this at its core to help you. What goes on in the mind, what he is prohibiting here is fantasizing because that's where passion starts. That's where deception succeeds. Listen, the fantasy world is a very, very real world. There are monsters that are birthed in the fantasy world. Because you and I begin to fantasize and it begins to drain our time. It begins to drain our emotion, our strength. It, it kind of moves into our heart and our life like a dense fog. You look at the computer that you, or that person at work, you begin to think, man, my wife doesn't look like that anymore. My, why doesn't my wife do this? Why doesn't my wife do that? You know, six, there's 6.7 sex scenes per hour on all the top TV shows. That, that's not even to count the movies that, that we're, we're looking at. Or we begin to think, man, I wish my husband would be that kind. I, you know, I wish my husband would be that that, that, that more, uh, more tender and more romantic, like what I'm watching, what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing from other women at work. He doesn't do that. He just comes and sits on the couch after he does, I mean, he's, he's lifeless. <laughs> and then we begin to think, you know, and, this, and time's going on, and all these things are happening in our heart. We say, man, if only I made that decision way back then. And it gets real quiet in here because everyone at one point and another can struggle in moments like that. All of us struggle. 
The question is, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? And God in his love and wisdom and compassion tells us, these things will diminish your life. They'll diminish your life. It will keep you from knowing fulfillment. It'll keep you from knowing true happiness. It'll keep you from blessing. It will drain your vitality. It's going to drain your energy. This is what the writer of Proverbs meant when he writes in Proverbs 5.16. Hey, drink water from your own cistern. Flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets. We have to realize and know that greater is he, 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world that draws us in, that tries to trap us, that tries to depreciate life from us. And God says, I want to give life. I don't want to take it away. I want you to enjoy life. I don't want you to have pain. I don't want you to have sorrow. Because that's how much I love you. Well, let's look at the deliverance. You say, well, Dale, what do I, what do, I do? Here's what Jesus says. If your right eye causes you to sin, <clears throat> tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Wow. I didn't say that. That's straight from the Bible. I mean, you can look at all different interpretations and everything, but I mean, that's... Did you know that the average number of sex partners in a, just in America is, is 10.7? Almost 11 sexual partners before their, their life ends. And here's a, something that's very sad. Nine out of 10 Americans have had sex outside of marriage. Nine out of 10. Jesus says, greater is he who is in you. Greater is he that is in you than all the things that are in the world that try to diminish your life that try to haunt you, that, that begin to work in this spiritual dynamic that you can't see. And God says, I know you can't see it. That's why I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's why I want to help you. That's why I want to keep you from pain. So Jesus says something that we read there and it seems pretty hard, but if the sinning is in the heart, then we would think, well, why would you get rid of your eye? After all, you know, a blind person can lust. A blind person can commit adultery or be, have, have uh, abuse sensuality. The point here is not a physical remedy to a heart problem. So to the Jewish person, the right eye, the hand or the leg, all the rights, were, were representative of a person's most cherished, valuable possession. You know, if you were left-handed there, you were in trouble. Like, I'd be in trouble. They'd, they, would, you'd be, they would do everything to make you right-handed and go with the right hand. And so, so, so this is what, and Jesus, again, knowing his audience, when I, when I teach our D3 guys and gals, and I always say, listen, you got to know your audience. You can't go into children's ministry and preach this message. You know, you gotta, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm out with Matt, I'm going to have a different message. You know what I'm, I'm going to say? Well, I'm just going to do what I did on Sunday. No. So Jesus knows his audience. He knows what they know. He knows what they don't know. So he uses this illustration. So Christ is saying, listen, when it comes to battling lust, there is nothing too precious to eliminate from your life. Wow. Church, the word causes is a hunting term. It, it literally means to bait, to, to, to test you. It draws you in. So even if it's your most precious 
possession. God says, hey, maybe you should get rid of that. Maybe, maybe you're here today and you're attracted to, to the opposite sex at work and you're in a full-blown affair. And, and God says, listen, you need to stop that. You need to end that. You say, Dale, or you say, Dale, well, you don't understand things I'm going through. Maybe you're, today you're living with a person and, and, and you're having sex and there's intimacy there. And you say, well, Dale, listen, if I, if I separate and we, we, we separate, uh, you don't understand the financial setback that it's going to cost me. Well, what Jesus is trying to say is, hey, you may not completely understand the eternal setback that this possibly could cause you. Better temporary, temporarily to be a poor person and learn a lesson and allow God to work in our lives and our heart than to be a well-off person who has an adulterous heart and winds up in hell. I mean, this is what Jesus is saying, and I tried very hard to find a way out of this as I was studying it. Not because of me, not because of me, but, but how can I soften this blow? I mean, I, I just couldn't do it. I mean... I would love to sit down with you if, if, if you could find that, but I, I, could not, I could not do it. And Jesus, again, what really helps me as I'm preaching some of these messages is that, that I, I see that the character of God and how much he really loves me and how much he doesn't want me to hurt and walk through pain and frustration. I don't like being depressed. I don't like it when I'm, my heart is full of anxiety. I don't like it when I feel guilty. I don't like it when I'm angry. I don't like that in me. And, and God says, listen, I'm trying to help you so you don't have to have a lot of that in your life, Dale. And I, I, want, I want to bless you. But, but this is the analogy that Christ is actually making. And I know it may sound severe, severe, but listen, there is one thing that is true about sin. And that is, we will either destroy it or it will destroy us. Colossians says this in Colossians 3, 5. Hey, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. In other words, your own desires. You have a relationship with God. You know that this is something that is keeping you away from God. This is something that as you study the word of God, it's, you could see that this is, God does not love this. He does not like it. He does not endorse it. So, so Paul says, listen, these things, in other words, sin has to be put to death. The flesh, you have to crucify it every single day, right? We have to take up our cross and follow him. And, and then he says some of the sexual immorality, impurity, false passions, evil desires, covetousness, because that is, <clears throat> he says, that is idolatry. You say, well, Dill, what do I do now? Because maybe today you are trapped in a, adulterous thoughts or actions. And now we have explained, right, through Jesus' sermon, Adultery, and what it means. It's a, it's a broader definition, maybe, than you thought when you came into this house. So what, what should we do? Well, I think first, the Bible says we need to confront it through confession. We, we confess this before God. You, you find a friend that you trust, that you trust, and you begin, to, you begin to share, hey, can you pray with me? Can you hold me accountable? I'm struggling. And if they're condemning, then they're really not a friend. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. When two Christians come together and you say, listen, I'm struggling here. And, and, and then if I say, oh man, I don't want anything to do with you. No. We help one another. We bear one another's burdens. You know, we, we counsel through the word of God. Maybe you need to talk to your spouse this afternoon and, 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 and begin to, to express what you're walking through. 
there's, there's so many different things that we can do even in, within our church that we can help you with. I'm going to put them on the screen. We have a lot of resources. There's Covenant Eyes, Fortify. We have our life group, Band of Brothers. You can go on our website and look at that. We have our life group, Celebrate Recovery. Freedom is another life group. Our marriage life group. We have marriage counseling that we offer here at the church. And that's just at the church. We have other resources that that if you're hurting and you need help or you need to make an appointment with me or one of the pastors and, and talk things through. Listen, we're not going to condemn. We all have sinned. I've sinned. We all fall short of God's glory. We're in this together. God wants the best for us. And we should want the best for each other. We should never want to see another person fail and fall and say good for them. They finally got theirs. We don't want that. But we want now if someone does not get help and they continue in that vein, then God's going to have to deal with that. And then I think we need to renounce it completely. If you're married today, listen. God did not send him or her into your life. I just felt I needed to say that. If you're married and you're, you're on that line and the fantasy world has engulfed you, God did not send that man or woman into your life. You are a part of the sickness. So, so, so you can't bring healing to that person. So if you're in a relationship and someone's married and you're trying to, and there's lustful thoughts and, and, and it's starting to happen, listen, you are a part of that sickness. So you have to pull back. You have to renounce that completely. Listen, when we let God rule our heart, there is victory. God can cleanse us and he can restore us. The psalmist says in Psalm 60, 12, with God, we shall be victorious. We shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. It is he who will raise us up. Listen, when our sins are great, his grace is greater. His grace is greater. I mean, a message, amen, a message like this would be virtually overwhelming. If I couldn't look you in the eye and say, listen, God loves you. God cares for you. God doesn't want you and I in pain. God will forgive. God will help. God will restore. He is greater than anything that this world has to offer you. It's, it's, it's refreshing when we look at it, how God is, is, is giving this to us. And, and listen, with an illustration like I did like this, and maybe you're, 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 you're feeling condemned. Again, there's no condemnation. I wanna, I, want, I wanna read you something in the Word of God, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 21. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, in full assurance of our relationship with him, with our hearts sprinkled, watch this, clean from an evil conscience. It's not a God, that's not God, it's from the enemy. Because when we ask for forgiveness, our conscience is clear. There's no condemnation. And that's why the Bible says that. When we are in Christ Jesus and we begin to move forward in Christ Jesus. He says, watch this, and I love this. Our bodies. Remember what I read about the body in Genesis? Remember what I read about the body in Corinthians? Our bodies now are pure. Our bodies are washed. Our bodies now are redeemed. We are set free. God does not hold our past sins against us. And so, so there is now freedom, but God does not want us to experience and to even go through that. 
right? He wants to keep us from that. 